Hi, welcome back to class. Let's talk about chapter 7 today in our textbook on uh, analyzing your conflicts. This is a difficult chapter. I was all set to try to do the lecture on this uh, last Friday and I just sensed that I needed to ponder the chapter for the weekend and then uh, post it uh, after a little more thought. You know, I, I read this chapter how many times over the years and I, I've always sensed there's something I'm missing here and I hopefully I've nailed that down and can highlight that for you so that you don't miss it also. And what that something is, I, I think is manifest in this picture here. Uh, this is a picture of a very complex network, maybe something like Northern Arizona University with all of the different uh, connections and players and possibilities and departments and within each department you start at the bottom with our graduate student teachers, uh, we have instructors, we have lecturers, we have three layers of professors, we have associate chairs, department chairs, and they all fit into a school that has about eight different departments. And that school is just one school of about eight different schools at NAU. And there are layers of administration in each one. And then we have people that take care of the buildings, people that take care of the grounds, we have dormitories and food. And, and, and you can see that it's a very complicated network. I start with that because all of conflict happens within some kind of network, however simple or however complicated it might be. And I am convinced that one key to really grasping the nature of a conflict and knowing how to approach it is to understand that network or that system. Let's call it a system like the chapter does. We've already talked about how we have a typical a default conflict style. We've defined what conflict is between two different parties. We've talked about your power currencies. Uh, some important ideas in these earlier chapters. But now let's start to set this in a context. And probably the easiest way to look at this, I think the textbook rightly does this, uh, sorry about my email going off here, is within the context of systems theory. Systems theory is uh, just an approach. Sometimes it's called cybernetics. You've probably heard that term. And it's really a lot simpler than it sounds. It's really the approach that says we're going to look at this group of people that are working together to achieve something as a system. Uh, sometimes people look at a biological system as a metaphor. Any, uh, from a single cell uh, bacteria to a, or I guess a bacteria has multiple cells to uh, living organisms and you have these bodily systems and if things don't work right the system gets out of balance and death can occur and that's a metaphor perhaps for looking at a, a system and I want to look at two different types here in the lecture uh, one would be the family system a lot of conflict happens in families uh, the other would be a work system an organizational system and uh, I, you've seen these mobiles people build these and you hang them from your ceiling and they're perfectly balanced and they're, they have strings and bars between them. And if you think of this as another metaphor for a system, and each one of the uh, bars uh, is uh, a relationship between people or is uh, communication between people. The strings are also representing relationships and communication and each one of the dots represents a person. You could stretch this and say some people have more power than others. They're weightier, they're heavier, they balance things out more. And uh, that may or may not be accurate, but I think the metaphor helps understand what we're dealing with in a family. Uh, and we can use my own family for an example. We have four people in our immediate family that form a small system. Our purpose for existing together is to live and to enjoy life. I mean, it's, it's fairly simple at this level. And we want to have happy lives. And when people are unhappy, when their goals aren't being met, when they're not satisfied, in, it's often uh, the problem is with relationships and we have conflict within the family. And we have a couple of parents, I'm the dad. Um, my wife is a very strong personality. Uh, I do not dominate the family. I don't know that she dominates it. We try to work together in that regard. And as our children have grown older, 
our daughter is now 20, my son is 23, our son. Uh, they have taken on more weight and we try not to, uh, we, we backed off in trying to control their lives as they get older and let them become adults and get them launched into their own families. And, but we have this system at work and there's often conflict between people, between um, mom and me, the dad, between uh, the daughter and the mother often. Uh, son tends to avoid conflict and hide out, but he has it and we've got to deal with it at some point, regardless of who he's in conflict with. But we're a system, we're balanced, we're connected, we live in the same house. When somebody gets all out of balance and uh, has trouble, uh, the whole family starts swirling around and uh, getting out of balance. Or, and sometimes an outside force, the wind will come and blow. Something out from the exterior will cr uh, harm, not harm, but challenge the family in some way, and everybody gets out of balance with that. Okay, a key concept of system theory, well, let's run through a few of those here. One is, um, really, the system is uh, talking about the interdependence of relationships created within organizations or within families. We are interdependent, and that's, you know, a, a key term right out of our definition of conflict in two interdependent parties. Well, Often there's a third and a fourth and a fifth party, and we're all in a system, and when mom and dad have conflict, the kids feel it, and their lives are affected by it, and maybe their goals aren't being met. And so there's interdependence between everybody. So that's the first thing we recognize about systems. Interdependence is key. And it's within an organized structure. Often there's a hierarchy. Uh, and let's say always there's a hierarchy within a system. And within the family, it's... Uh, Sometimes it's a very dominating father or a very dominating mother at the top. Uh, and uh, in the case, uh oh, getting a little uh -huh. notice uh -huh. that Microsoft wants to do something with my computer. We'll just postpone that. Often we get out of, you know, we have somebody's in power in the hierarchy. And I, I say more or less here because sometimes hierarchies are very structured with somebody at the top and everybody has to do what they're told within a family or an organization, often there's less hierarchy. And the family will sit down at the dinner table, where do you want to go on vacation this year? And everybody has an equal input on it and their opinions and uh, desires are respected. And then we negotiate and trade off, well, we can't go where you want to go this year, we'll go there next summer. We'll do Christmas break here or whatever. And we negotiate that. So the power would be more uh, actually democratic. We have hierarchy, we have power at work here. And it can be more or less democratic or there can be more or less of a hierarchy. Okay, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. With the hierarchy, uh, it's very structured, top to bottom. And uh, some people know they're at the bottom of the hierarchy, there's a pecking order, and somebody's at the top. Other families, other organizations have a, a very flat hierarchy, where maybe somebody's the boss, but they're really not very high above somebody else. They don't have a lot of power over them. and. Uh, from the top to bottom is only a couple of layers. There are organizations like this institution of this university that uh, there may be uh, one, two, I'm counting very quickly, um, three, probably five layers between my position and the president of the university. But there are other organizations like FedEx, there's only four layers from the CEO all the way down to uh, the uh, lowest level employees that load the trucks part time. Four layers. It's a very flat organization and hierarchically. Power then has to do with uh, absolute power of a monarchy CEO at the top or a more of a democratic type uh, power structure within. Systems have these things. Okay, this material isn't really from the book, but uh, the next slide's right out of the book here and it talks about uh, systems are balanced. And uh, a system that's not balanced. Uh, doesn't function well and has to find some kind of equilibrium or it, it dies. Uh, an organization, a company can go bankrupt and die and everybody loses their jobs if it's not balanced. Balance perhaps being defined as making a profit continuously and everybody happy with their role and functioning it to the best of their ability. Uh, systems have a wholeness to them. Uh, you can't look at just one part without looking at, at the whole. Now, it's probably easier to look at a system like this with the four fish on the mobile, uh, with the environment, the air blowing it around, and 
uh, than it is something like Northern Arizona University as complex as it is. Uh, but you probably could uh, design a, a flow chart of NAU that was actually fairly accurate and perhaps somebody has one up in the upper administration. But they are whole. They operate as a whole. If uh, something, an uh, administrator in NAU even makes a decision and decides to raise the tuition exorbitantly high, it affects everything. Students quit coming to school here. Uh, teachers are, will be laid off. Uh, there is a, a big effect on everybody. One decision in one place can really affect things. The economy can affect it. Now these are these outside forces. It affects everybody because there's a wholeness, there's balance. The systems are organized and typically the lines of organization are fairly clear. Often organizations will have a flow chart of that and they exist in patterns. There are um, patterns of uh, behavior. Uh, the, the organization itself is, is patterned in a way and people interact with these other according to uh, prescribed patterns and rules. Okay, so the system is we're still talking broadly here. We haven't talked about conflict between people, but you have to recognize it occurs within a system. Even when you have a conflict with a coworker about who has to work this weekend, you're within at least, at the very least, a small system with probably several other coworkers, and decisions may affect them with a boss, with perhaps a mid level uh, somebody who schedules, a, an assistant manager, uh, you've got an owner, and uh, even in a small company, let's say a restaurant, uh, you have a system and you probably know where, how it's balanced and you could place everybody on a mobile if you wanted to draw one out. Uh, but conflict always happens within those and when conflict comes, it can often throw the system out of balance for a while until it's resolved. Uh, it can threaten the system. And uh, the book even mentions that sometimes conflict has a function within uh, systems uh, and that out of balanceness uh, has its part. Okay, a few uh, postulates about uh, these systems here are conflict occurring in systems. Conflict often occurs with in, in chain reactions conflict and so if I'm in a, an organization I have a conflict with an, another employee here uh, often the, the boss may try to mediate or it may have an effect on other people and so a chain reactions can happen if, and if the issue is serious enough it might cause other people it might be a triggering event for other people to get involved. Members of the system get programmed or you get uh, defined in some way and programmed into a certain role within that system and you probably I, like in my case I'm a lecturer here at the university and that lecturer has a prescribed role and I try to stay within it and conflicts I have probably need to occur within that role and not get out of it very far. It takes cooperation between parties in a system to keep conflict going. You can read through these in the textbook. Uh, there are good explanations with each one of these. Uh, and uh, this is wh where we're going to head next so is that uh, triangles, conflict triangles and coalitions will form as a conflict gets more and more intense and essentially triangles and coalitions are people bonding together taking sides in the conflict. The rules of the conflict will be followed even if they don't really work for the organization or the family. We typically have these rules and we stick with them. So in one family it may be all about you just avoid and you keep avoiding until somebody placates silently and, or obliges and gives somebody else what they want and gradually communication and will resume and avoidance will uh, uh, decrease until the next conflict comes along. But somebody who gets all verbal about it in that family and says exactly what they're thinking, they're breaking a rule and uh, that changes the system in some way if somebody's going to continue to do that. As I mentioned earlier, conflict often serves the system in some way. Uh, sometimes it helps to resolve problems and so conflict is allowed to happen and engineers can disagree about things and have uh, and bring those to the managers or to a committee to try to solve problems and conflict can serve a system. All right, conflict triangles are when you have a, one, a low-powered person in a conflict, let's say with the boss, employee one, EE1, that's uh, kind of shorthand for employee in organizational literature. EE1 has a conflict with the boss, 
Well, they get EE number two to side with them and perhaps have a conversation about uh, somebody's not getting enough hours at the company and they talk to EE2 and uh, persuade them to kind of take their side and uh, you know because you may be the next one to not get enough hours if, if they're going to treat me this way they're going to treat you this way so why don't you work with me and let's try to bring some balance to my conflict with the boss. I was once in a union the electricians union here in Arizona and uh, essentially the electricians union was a well, we'll call it a coalition I'll get to that in a minute here all right within these conflict triangles uh, when they can get balanced two employees here let's say at a small restaurant these are the two servers that do most of the serving and they have a, a boss who uh, sets their hours and de determines who gets which tables and some tables get bigger tips than other tables and and so you have the potential for conflict here but as people within the triangle move closer to one another an employee one might move closer to the boss to try to get what they want and get concessions out of employee number two but as people move toward or away from one another relationally that brings instability into the triangle and uh, causes that really makes a conflict, it could be a triggering event. These triangles can turn toxic when there's continual conflict, when you can't find the balance there between people and there's just continual conflict and relationships can eventually break down because of that. Now, the point the book's trying to make here in this chapter is that you have a system, you have all these people within the family or within the organization that are in a system that has to be treated as a whole and it's balanced and everybody's connected and well, when conflict arises people form into these triangles and you can literally uh, sit down list everybody and start drawing out who's in triangles with who else and uh, show these triangles and they can help you get a handle on where who's actually in conflict and maybe a triangle's been formed and these two employees will never settle it without the boss stepping in and taking a side uh, but they can, uh, the triangles help us to analyze the conflict. It's a way to map out what's happening. And again, my computer has a mind of its own. Okay, when there's more people involved than just three, uh, we'll call it a coalition. And uh, these form when people are closer to some people than other people, and they don't have to necessarily be bringing in people for power, but they tend to bond together in groups. What happens with coalition that's important here is that information flow gets restricted and you don't necessarily hear everything, the, the talk around the organization. This could happen, I suppose, in a larger family, but not quite as likely. Uh, but within larger organizations, it will. Now, I'd mentioned I was a member of the Electricians Union, and we definitely had our coalitions there. In fact, some of them were even formalized. Uh, we had a, a structure within it, a hierarchy of... Um, who gets preference in hiring, and we called it the book system. Uh, book one, book two, book three, and book four. Book one was a journeyman wireman who was a member of the Phoenix local. Book two was somebody, let's say a journeyman wireman, uh, and that's a classification of uh, skills, from Albuquerque or from Los Angeles. That we're out of work, no work in their town, and they would come over, uh, and they are on book two, we call it. And that was the four different out of work lists and when they partitioned out jobs, they would call everybody's name who had signed book one and offer them the job first. And if nobody from book one wanted all the jobs, then they would open up book two and start calling those names. And uh, book three were people that were not journeyman wiremen, uh, but could be from our own local or another local. And then book four was when there's so much work, we just have to put an ad in the newspaper and hire anybody we can. And these were not full members of the union. That hierarchy of hiring then out to contractors who were doing electrical contracts uh, went right into the structure of the work crews. And journeymen got the preferential work, the joke journeyman from the local got the best jobs, journeyman from other locals uh, maybe did crappier work. Overtime was partitioned out according to your rank here in the system. And But coalitions would form. And uh, one of the most famous ones uh, is called the Federation of Linemen Electricians. Uh, they're known as the Fleas. And the Fleas formed because during the 60s and 70s, 
There was a lot of unfair practices going on on jobs, and people would travel to other locals to work because work was tight in their jurisdiction, and then they would be mistreated. They would be, have, be extorted by the foreman. You need to pay $100 a month to the foreman, or you're going to get laid off, and you'll be looking for work again. And uh, people were really ganging up on the traveling wiremen, and so we had coalitions like here. We had a foreman, let's say, with four three journeyman wiremen and an apprentice, number four there, and then they might have four traveling wiremen that are working with them from book two, and they would be treated badly. Uh, this is simplified because the job would might have 100 or 200 wiremen on it. And so the travelers bonded together, formed their own club to give them power, and they started opposing the uh, people, the foreman and the other local people that worked together, that knew each other better, and uh, if you picked on one of the travelers and tried to extort them, you might find uh, ten guys knocking at your door one night. And they, they did this almost out of survival, and it eventually evolved into a situation where throughout the nation, uh, a big job like the Palo Verde nuclear plant back in the 80s, uh, travelers would come there to work and would take over and get their people in foreman positions and give the overtime to their people that were member of their groups. And so uh, these very interesting coalitions within a very large and complex organization and it typically found a balance and things worked out and when there were conflicts it would throw things out of balance for a while but they would get resolved. Okay, when you're on the outside these coalitions look like cliques, that's what we call them and they happen all the way through high school, right into the work world, and uh, you know when you're on the outside, you're not getting the information flow that the others would get. Okay, I, I really want to, as we wind up the uh, lecture here, go back and think about systems theory. And just, it's really a simple idea that we do form organizational systems comprised of people with varying levels of power, with different job responsibilities and skill sets, and uh, they're all working towards a common goal and conflict happens. But if you don't have a handle on the nature of the system, if you can't kind of diagram it out in some way, and then using these tools of drawing the coalitions or drawing the triangles, whether it's in your family or at work, it is helpful for you to have these things drawn out and uh, diagrammed to understand exactly who's having conflict with whom, who is on their side, how are they trying to enhance their power through triangles and coalitions. And uh, this is a profound chapter, yet at the same time I think it's rather simple. Now the latter half, latter few pages of the chapter uh, provide a very systematic way of a asking a set of questions about an organization to try to help you get a handle on the nature of that system, what it looks like, what it feels like, and where conflict is at to help you diagram it. If you really go into a, a mediation type career, these kinds of things will become much more important. I'm kind of focusing this, class, focusing this class more on interpersonal communication that extends into the work world from the family, and uh, we will learn to deal with conflict and how to mediate conflicts others are having. But especially if you're a mediator, uh, you need to understand the system and where the parties are in reference to one another and where the power is. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for listening. Uh, read this chapter closely and we will talk to you in the next lecture.